I cannot believe that I just spilled some wine on my laptop. And so today there's no fancy microphone. It's just me and the camera. Hopefully the sound is okay. I wanted to hop on here and give some answers to the questions you guys sent in a month ago. And there were some really good questions and I can't wait to get into them. This is gonna be a little bit more of a conversational video just because a lot of them have a lot of gray area. It's not necessarily black and white. And I wanna do those questions justice by giving the different perspectives and my whole thought process behind them. The first question is, do you still Airbnb? Yes, we still have the beach house that we mainly talk about on this channel and we no longer host the backyard tiny house that we initially started with. I did a whole video on the reasons why if you want to check that out. But yeah, the beach house is doing great and we're looking into buying another property hopefully this year. I think the underlying question here is, is this still like a profitable thing to do right now? Um, and certainly I think it's harder than when I started because the interest rates are higher, housing prices are still really high. I think the focus has to be something that's more unique, more of a memorable experience that people are willing to pay for versus a more kind of cookie cutter experience from a hotel. The next question is how do you identify a good property for rent to rent? I assume this means how do you find a property that is a good deal as an investment? And I've done videos on these before. I'll link them below. The main thing really is to start with actually your goals. Are you looking for something that cash flows that, you know, you need X number of dollars per month to allow you to quit your job, for example? Or are you looking for something to diversify your portfolio with? Like you don't want it to be all stocks and bonds in your retirement accounts. You want this other chunk to also be real estate just for that risk diversification and to build equity and wealth. Those are two very different approaches. And I think that helps you narrow down. Are you looking for like many, many units of like apartment buildings in a co-hosting and arbitrage situation? Or are you looking at buying something that might be a little bit more expensive upfront and doesn't bring in a ton of cash flow? but over the long term makes more sense as a wealth building tool. And then as far as picking a market, I have a video on that. And once you've picked the market, it's all about just practicing and looking at what is for sale, what the rents could be either in a short term or long term rental sense, repeating and practicing that math on a day to day basis. There's really no shortcut, at least no non scammy and risk appropriate shortcuts to finding good deals because you really do have to learn the market, how much everything goes for. And the only way you can learn to spot a good investment is to continuously look at different investments and analyze them and get into that pattern so that you can spot the one that is a better deal than the rest of them. Next question, I am currently trying to set up an Airbnb for my two spared bedrooms in the apartment I am living in. Can you give some advice regarding how to go about renting rooms in your personal living space? I have somewhat of a similar experience in renting out our backyard tiny house, even though it has a separate entrance, it does feel like it is something that is in my normal living space. So um, I'm just gonna throw out a few things you might wanna think about. The first thing is parking. If you live in an apartment building, does your apartment already come with like a designated parking spot? Where will the extra people be parking their cars? And does it matter that there are different people all the time? Like, do you need to register these cars? Like, how, is there a fob? Some of these logistical questions that you just have to think through and maybe ask management and make sure that that's okay. Number two is kind of your insurance policy. Whatever insurance that you currently carry, may not include protection for you as a landlord, like renting it out to other people, and it may not provide protection to the people who are coming in to rent your place. So looking through the fine print of your insurance and figuring out if you need a different kind of coverage. And then thirdly, I would think through how you wanna share your existing space. Like, will you be sharing the kitchen, the living room, the bathrooms? I don't think there is a black and white, you need to do X, Y, and Z. It's all just about communicating what your expectations are so that the people who sign up to rent your Airbnb know coming in that, oh yeah, I only have access to the kitchen, but I don't get access to the TV or whatever room that you don't want them to have access to. I would spell out very specifically in your Airbnb listing what common spaces are shared, um, what spaces are off limits, what spaces might be a private space for them, like the bedroom itself would be private. Is there like an attached bathroom? All of those things you'll have to kind of just spell out. And then lastly, I don't think this would apply if it's a very short term kind of Airbnb space that you're renting out like this. But if you're renting it out for like 
a couple weeks or a month at a time, do they have some level of responsibility of what they do with their trash? Like, do you want them to clean up after themselves? And if so, to what extent? Is there a cleaning service that comes through every week or every other week? Again, there isn't like a standard or a requirement. It's just that you need to be very clear about your expectations so that they know coming in what they need to do, what they're signing up for. Next question is about Netflix. I'm using Netflix and I would like to add it in my cottage for guests. Will there be any risk? I'm thinking if they accidentally logged out and asked me for a password, what do I do? Or if they have their own account and want to use theirs instead. The next guest may ask as well, is there a nice way to deal with this? So I know there are people that offer the subscriptions as part of their rental. Uh, we don't do that. Partly because a lot of people these days just have their own subscriptions that they can easily log in as long as you have a good Wi-Fi where they can log in. So fortunately, we haven't run into any issues by not providing that. If you do want to provide that service for them and you're worried about the password situation, I think you'll really just have to change the password to a password that you don't use for anything else. Like obviously don't use the same password that you would for a bank account. And yeah, sometimes it'll get disconnected and you'll have to re-give them the password to log in. If you're worried about them taking that password and going elsewhere with it, you might also want to think about rotating passwords routinely. It can definitely be done if there's any of you that currently do this, feel free to share below what you're doing with the password management and making sure people aren't stealing the passwords. I think for, as far as your comment about whether there's a nice way to deal with this, it might just have to do with expectations. Like if they come rolling in expecting Netflix, I'm curious how they came to expect that. There was one guest that asked at some point if we have any streaming services that we are subscribed to. And we just kind of said, no, we don't, but you're welcome to log in with any of your own streaming services. And we never heard anything bad from them and they gave us a good review. So I don't think that's like a penalty to not offer it. What do you guys think? All right, next question. Would you explore the idea of purchasing a fully furnished house if possible? I imagine the cost to furnish will be quite substantial and the prospect of being able to tie it into the mortgage is enticing. Yes. So we didn't tie it into the mortgage, but we did purchase furniture from the previous owner for our beach house because she did a pretty good job furnishing it. And honestly, it was just such a quick turnaround to like buy all new furniture and set it up and do all that kind of remotely. When that was presented to us as an option, we jumped on it. Next part of the question is, however, it gives me pause if the seller had listed the home as an STR before, why would they sell it if it's profitable? I agree. Our person actually lived there, so they didn't rent it out. Um, but that would give me a bit of pause. I think there could be many reasons. They might be trying to liquidate it. Maybe they just don't feel like they want to deal with having a short-term rental. The hassle is, the juice is not worth the squeeze, as they say. Or maybe they want the liquid cash to go invest in, I don't know, crypto. Or they might want a 1031 into something else. There might be valid reasons that doesn't mean that that was a bad investment for them. As always, though, you have to do your due diligence. Is this vacation rental actually going to make what you think it'll make? Do you need to double check your numbers on that projection? And then also like just Google that location and regulations and see if there are like recent town hall meetings about proposed regulations that are going to happen in a few months time. And this maybe this owner got wind of it and they're selling before that comes into effect. I don't know. Or you can look at like the flood map, maybe that designation change? Is there like a tax change or property tax kind of change? Stuff like that. I agree. It would give me pause to be like, why are you selling it? But I think those are things you can sort of mitigate against by looking it up. And it doesn't hurt to ask. Like you can ask your realtor to ask their realtor. They'll give you some sort of answer. It's just up to you to decide are they telling the truth or not? In general, I actually also like to look into the seller of the property to see if there's like a backstory of why they're selling, where did they come from, where do they work. Does that make me kind of a crazy person? I don't know, but it's not that hard to Google people and it sometimes helps to understand their motive behind whatever they're selling, regardless of whether they've used it as a short-term rental before. And then the question ends with my inaction and inability to just pull the trigger and buy something stinks. I don't think so. I think it's good to take your time and really think about this and make sure you're making a good decision. This is a big purchase. You're not buying like a bag of bagels from the store. You're 
buying something that is like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I think you are doing it right. You are just taking your time analyzing. Only you will know whether you're truly stuck in analysis paralysis or you are just not finding the good deals that you wanted and none of the things you're looking at fit your criteria. And that's okay. All right, the next group of questions have to do with coaching and mentorship. Um, and the short answer is I do not offer any courses or coaching or mentoring uh, opportunities here. I really appreciate everyone who has reached out so far and think I can help. I think that's very flattering, but I don't think you need it. That's what it comes down to. A lot of us that you see on the internet that have established your own Airbnb business or what have you, we didn't start with a mentor. We started with the free resources that are available to all of us online. And that's not to deny that maybe some of us have larger capitals to start with. Some people may have existing connections or maybe they have certain skills that they carried forward from whatever they did professionally before. But none of this Airbnb hosting stuff is that difficult and you can totally learn everything completely for free. So if you are like a beginner, especially if you're like a student, I've had a lot of students reach out for some surprising reason. I don't know if there's like somebody on TikTok advising people that they should go seek a mentor. I, anyway, I highly encourage everyone to just try to do as much as they can because 99.9% .9 of the learning, it has to be done by you, even if you find a mentor. A couple instances where I think maybe having a mentor or a coach might make sense for you is if you like have a really high income job and you really value your time and you just want to condense your learning time from, I don't know, 40 hours to 10 hours and you're willing to pay somebody for their time because your time is worth more. And yeah, I think that would be a reasonable investment. This would not include you if you are a student who barely have enough capital to start investing. That does not apply to you. A second scenario that I've seen and actually I've personally helped with is people who have done like 99.9% .9 of the work, they've learned everything that they can, they are close to making a decision and or they've already made a decision to set up their Airbnb, but they just want a second set of eyes who can come in fresh and relook at everything to make sure like all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And in those cases, I think it makes sense to pay like just a small flat fee to someone who can offer their expert opinion and help point out anything that's missing or at least give you reassurance that you're completely on the right track. A consultative fee would be relatively pretty small compared to the size of the investment you're about to make in purchasing a whole house. And I guess if this is the route you choose to go to get a second opinion, just make sure that person is actually knowledgeable in the knowledge that you're seeking and also that they don't have major conflicts of interest that compels them to tell you one way over the other because of their personal interest. Because again, like most things in the financial industry, they are not fiduciary to you and they can really say whatever they want. So you really have to be careful who you choose to trust in this space. Next bunch of questions. It's very likely I'll be purchasing an investment property to short-term rent soon, never done it before. With this in mind, here are the questions. One is what market indicators do you use to decide where to buy? I just did a video on how to pick a market. And I suppose as far as just pure metrics, not like regulations and my personal enjoyment, the indicators that I really care about are the projected revenue and the occupancy. I guess the occupancy works together with the daily rate to produce the projected revenue. But just knowing myself, I can't handle an occupancy average that is below 50%, even if it means the peak season brings in a huge amount of money. I think that degree of fluctuation would just not be compatible with like me and my mental health. But yeah, I guess if I had to pick my biggest metric, it would be the projected revenue total as a combination of the ADR and the occupancy. And overall, how it's been trending in recent years. Is it going up, down, and is it fluctuating or pretty stable? Legally mandated night minimums as a response to problems in the market, would this be a deal breaker for you? Would this be a deal breaker? Not really. I guess how many nights are we talking? Is it like seven or is it two? Two is reasonable. Seven I think is tricky. Or are we talking like 30 days? That to me is not even a short-term rental. I suppose it would give me pause. And number two, what experience elements or options have I found most effective? So I think some of the most important elements are like location which is not something you can add on, but something you can factor in before you buy. 
And as far as things you can add to it, people like the hot tub. I personally don't because it is such an infectious disease hazard and I can't deal with it. Some of those things are disgusting and also the heating of the hot tub is a whole other expense. Maybe I'm just not a hot tub person. Swimming pools is the other element that I think can really add value and bring in more guests. We considered adding a pool actually for our beach house, but we thought it would be higher maintenance, higher utility bills. You would have to pay someone to come in monthly to clean the pool and to do chemicals and stuff for the pool. And we looked at our local market. All of those expenses do seem to translate to a higher average daily rate and a higher total revenue. But gut feeling, I don't know where consumer sentiment is going. I don't know if people are gonna spend as much money on travel as they did before. And so we haven't taken the plunge because it is a really big investment to add a pool. The things we have done are the arcade machine, which is a pretty easy installation and people have fun. We've had people comment that this was a fun game room and they, they like having a game room. Um, Having a sufficient game room also like checks the category of play on Airbnb so that you do show up if people are searching for a house that has features of, I don't know, play, I don't know what play entails on Airbnb. I think it's like pool tables and game room and other like board games maybe, I'm not sure. I've seen people build pickleball courts and add other like mini golf elements, which are really cool. I don't know what the ROI is on those. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to add. I'm curious if anyone has other elements that they have added to their Airbnb, I'd love to hear that. And number three, if you could give yourself one piece of advice when you were first starting out, what would it be? It's been like a couple years since we've started. I think in the beginning, there was a lot to learn. I'm just trying to like reimagine myself in that space like we were learning how to do pricing we were learning how to do guest messaging what kind of tone do i want to strike and i think it is overall just a steep learning curve for each of these components and i think it was helpful that we never got complacent with any of the above we kept trying to learn kept looking at different people and what they're doing and try to incorporate some of those things. There were definitely times that I felt like I wasn't learning fast enough because there's so much you can be doing. Like you could be setting up your social media account. You could be setting up direct booking. You could do better pictures. You could do like a million different things to improve. And as a person starting out in the beginner stage, everything was new. It was hard to know what thing to prioritize on. And it always felt like I should be doing more. I think my advice looking back, and this is advice that is still applicable to me today, is that this is not a sprint, it's more like a marathon. There's always going to be something new that changes in the algorithm. There's going to be new changes in regulations. What you're really learning is some general skills that can help you adapt in every environment. Make sure to take a balanced view because on the one hand, your listing will never be perfect. There is going to be something to improve on, something that changes in the external world that you have to adapt to. You can never be complacent. You always have to keep moving and learning and doing something to make yourself and make the listing better so that you can keep up. But on the other hand, you also have to recognize that there are a lot of forces beyond your control that you entered into this investment as an investment, like this is not supposed to take over your life. This is not supposed to be the only thing that you're doing. And to me, at least, this is supposed to be fun. Like I'm supposed to be enjoying going on vacation over there to spend time designing it because it's fun and to learn new things as long as it is enjoyable. So how do you be grateful and happy for what you've achieved so far and celebrate your wins, but still continue to evolve and continue to learn? I think it all comes down to keeping both sides of the equation in balance and staying curious and prioritizing those improvements at a reasonable pace so that you don't burn yourself out so that this remains a sustainable thing for you to do in the next number of years. Last one is, do you have advice on how much to invest in furnishing the home? So when I started, the metric that I heard floated around and was accurate for us was maybe $20 per square foot. I would imagine that it's a little higher now with inflation. So maybe $25 per square foot, depending on, I guess, how premium or how luxury your place is. How do you manage cleaners like sharing calendar? So depending on what property management software you use, you can have your cleaners also sign up to have the same app. Like Logify is an app-based thing. So you would add your cleaners and they would get notified 
through that app. Or for example, Hospitable, which I've used in the past, I just put in the cleaner's phone number and they would receive a text automatically when a guest books our house um, and they would get the check-in and check-out date, whatever message you want them to get as an automated thing. Next question, for beach markets, I don't see there is a viable option as HOA fees are too high. What market would be good? For me personally, I try to avoid anything that has an HOA fee, um, not because of the fee itself, but because of HOA rules. Like whoever is in the HOA board can get together and change their stance on whether short-term rentals are allowed or not. And that can happen a lot faster than like regular city regulations, for example. We're in a beach market and not under an HOA. So I know that they exist throughout. You just kind of have to look at different spots and even talk to the realtors. Once you've kind of narrowed down to a general range of where you want to invest, they can help you figure out which areas or which neighborhoods are more HOA heavy or not. Next question, you mentioned briefly that you had partners on the beach house. I would love to know how that is all set up. Are they investors? Do they have roles, responsibilities? I'm considering going in on a property with my sister-in-law and any advice would be appreciated. So yeah, our beach house is structured as a partnership and our partners brought most of the down payment and the cash up front, whereas we brought a little bit of cash, but all of the expertise, I guess. It sounds so cocky to call this expertise, but anyway, it, we did all of the labor of like researching the market, talking to realtors, purchasing the house, organizing the trip to set it up, doing the setup, doing the interior design. And then to this day, we do all of the management of that property. Our partners are completely passive and they don't really get involved into the day-to-day. We just send them a K-1 at the end of each year and they file their taxes. That's that's about it. As far as the legal structure, we chose to set up as an LLC and tax as a partnership. I feel like I've mentioned this tip before. If you have multiple partners and some of them will be like silent investors, make sure you take a look at the percentage split because every time you open a bank account or a credit card, you need everyone who has 25% ownership or more to enter their social security number and all of their info. And so you can imagine if you have like four partners and everyone has exactly 25%, it is kind of a hassle to like have four people get involved with each banking decision you make. So try to avoid that if you can, make it 24% if you have to. And then another thing I will say about partnerships with family and friends is that you still probably wanna be explicit about what your expectations are for each other. There are so many different ways I've heard just from friends um, about how their relationships and money intertwine in the family. You might want to spell out exactly what percentage are we each putting in? How will the work be split? Is it kind of a 50-50 kind of a work? Is it you do all of the upfront setup, whereas I'll do all of the ongoing management? How will the profits be split? Will it be 50-50 or will you pay everything back into the person who invested the capital upfront and then 50-50. And then another scenario you wanna think through is if one person is doing all of the property management, does it make sense to do a higher percentage split for the persons who are doing more of the work? Or would it make more sense to charge a property management fee, if you will, and then after that, split everything 50-50? There are infinite ways you can structure this. Having it all written down upfront and agreed upon by all the parties in the partnership, I think that is crucial to making sure everything is fair and no one has any resentment. And also outline if you were to exit, like if one partner no longer wants to do this, how does that work? Or who can decide to sell the property? Is this like a collective decision? What power and what role does everyone play in the overall business decisions? Or if you wanna like look into adding a pool, who has the power to make that call to invest like $100,000 into making a pool? How did you find your Airbnb project management company? And what specific things are you looking for in one of those companies? Actually, I'm rereading this. I'm assuming he means a property management company and we don't have a property management company. We manage our Airbnb remotely from here. Mostly everything can be done on the phone. So really the only thing we need that's like boots on the ground is our cleaners. And we also have our assistant that we pay as an on-call person that can respond to any emergencies or if a guest forgets something and they want us to like ship it back to them. And so I just need a person to run a few errands. We have that. 
And then thirdly, we have our handyman contacts that we often reach out to because there's always something to fix. The next question is, do you have a task list that you maintain in Google Sheet, Asana, or some other tool for everything from when your offer is accepted to when the property is live on Airbnb? Kind of like a project management task list. I kind of do. I started building it in Asana. It's not that complete. And honestly, I don't know if I'll reuse it the next time I have a property. Alternatively, I also have a Trello board that I've shared before. That one more has to do with like the house operational things, like making sure you have the utilities transferred, like checking off the list, like an HVAC inspection, making sure you change the door lock when you start, that kind of thing. So I will leave that below if you're interested. Next question. Uh, I think most of us can all agree that cleaners are the backbone of any rental. And for me, it's very complicated if it's even worth it to hire cleaners if we only have one property or apartment. Any suggestions? And if so, how can we hire cleaners? I definitely think having cleaners are worth it, even if you have time to clean it yourself. Partly it's because I don't think cleaning is fun. And secondly, I like that it removes myself in kind of the day-to-day -day looking at the apartment or at the property. Back when we were still hosting the tiny house, we would have a cleaner come through, but occasionally the cleaner would flake and we would have to do it ourselves. Or even when the cleaner comes, I would go there before the cleaner and just do a quick look over and make sure everything's not broken because it is our house and I just deeply care about the condition of the property. And I felt that it was too much, like I was getting too micro into the day-to-day -day running off an Airbnb. Like there was one time, there was this guest, it was not like even that bad. They just had some takeout in the tiny house and the tiny house is quite airtight. So like the whole place smells like food. The other thing was the guest must have had like a pair of socks that were really linty or something. There's like black sock fuss everywhere. It looked gross. I guess technically it's not like the most disgusting thing. It would just have cleared up with vacuuming. It's not that big of a deal, but somehow that visual of my beautiful house with black sock fuzz really stuck with me. And I remember getting so annoyed with them. I was like, oh, I'm not even going to write them a review. I'm so mad. It doesn't even make sense. Like I don't want to be involved to that level. If there was a cleaner that just took care of the space and all I saw was a glowing review from the guest, which is what happened with this sock fuzz person, I would have never been the wiser. And honestly, there was no benefit that came out of me knowing about this. The cleaners is kind of a buffer. It's a distance between me and the day-to-day -day goings on of the house. As far as how to hire them, it is very tricky, especially if you have like a smaller space, like an apartment, because they may not be wanting to come out just for like less than an hour's worth of work. Word of mouth can be helpful. We found our current cleaners through our realtor who also invests in short-term rentals and have contacts of her own. Otherwise, for the tiny house here, we've actually had luck finding someone from care.com. There are people that just look for odd jobs. There's obviously the babysitting jobs, but there are people who are looking just for some light cleaning. Turno is an Another option. It's an app that has cleaners on there for specifically flipping Airbnb properties. I haven't personally had too much luck with it because our local market is just a smaller market. There aren't very many cleaners on there and none of them wanted to drive like half hour here to do a small job and leave. I've looked at Turno for the beach area and there's definitely more options. So if you live in a bigger city or a more touristy destination, definitely check them out and they can pretty easily integrate into your calendar as well so that all of the cleaning requests can be automated if that's what you wanna do. All right, next bunch of questions, there's 11 of them. One, how to differentiate between city regulations being ridiculous and it just being normal challenges within the STR model. Kind of a subjective question. I think it really just comes down to whether you can figure out how to work around them for your situation. Two, what are your thoughts on home equity line of credit? Well, mm, I, I don't love it. Currently, especially, interest rates are so high. What are you doing with this line of credit that you think you can have better returns on? I'm definitely more risk averse. If you're looking at using this line of credit to purchase property, I would just wait. I would just save the money so that you have enough money to put in as a down payment because beyond that, you'll also need initial startup money to buy furniture, set up whatever legal structure you need for the property or the Airbnb business. And I can't really give you financial advice. I'm just talking through what I'm thinking about. 
I would prefer saving up the money and knowing I have enough to invest versus borrowing against something else to start up my short-term rental business because it is not a sure win. You can totally completely lose all of it. I would say if you have really good credit and you already have the capital available, but you want to not use all of it all up at once, a 0% APR credit card is totally a great idea to like earn some points, not get charged interest, but obviously only use that if you intend to pay in full at the end of it and you are able to meet all of the minimums during the zero period and you have like a good track record of not overspending, not carrying credit card debt, all of the things. You have to do this responsibly for it to make sense. Number three, examples of financial institutions that have business-friendly checking accounts besides the online platforms. I've only used online platforms to be completely honest. I did a video on the checking accounts that I've tried and do recommend. I have not really run into a need of going into a branch. I can't think of an example other than if you are physically holding a bunch of cash and you need to deposit it, you can take out cash because you have ATM cards. You can write checks because you can either print the check from this online app that goes directly to whoever you're trying to pay, or you can order a stack of checks for some of them. So yeah, I guess I don't have a good example of something that is not an online platform. Number four, should you hire a mentor that we have already discussed that? The short answer is no. I would only consider it if you already have a lot of money and you're trying to shorten the duration of your learning and or if you're mostly done, you just want to invest a small amount to a consultant of some sort to give you that final second opinion before you finally pull the trigger. Number five, can you please make an educational video on the taxes breakdown with Airbnb and Verbo? If we're talking about like tax deductions you can take as a person who invests, in something like a short-term rental business, maybe. We can do a future video on that. I'm not a tax expert, but I can totally share um, what I've learned so far. All right, number six, do you have any experience with the midterm rental platform pad split? No. Number seven, how much should a general rehab be around for a single family home being commercially used for STR purposes? I don't know. I've I've never done it, no clue. Eight, can you go over creative ways on how you can obtain capital for real estate in general? Um, you see my hesitation. <laughs> um, this is the benefit of doing these like Q&A videos. Um, so I did a video recently, not recently, I did a video on different 17 different ways, I think, of getting money to invest for real estate. And in there, I included some more creative ways. Without spoiling the whole video, I think creative methods of financing generally carry more risk. And at this current time, I don't know that short-term rentals are that lucrative for it to be worth you risking all these things. I can totally be wrong. I could just be looking in the wrong places. Maybe there are like crazy cash on cash returns somewhere that's 50% still. But even if there is, it's uncommon. I think some of the creative ways often cited are like seller financing. There is also like looking for partners. I think that one is actually a very valid and not as risky kind of thing. You'll notice actually, as soon as you start investing and that you share it with your friends and family, there are people who are interested in doing the same thing as you. And they will be like, oh yeah, the next time you have a deal, bring me along. Like I will chip in and I just ask to be included. Um, that could be a source of capital if you feel comfortable figuring out how best to partner with friends and family and making sure you delineate everyone's roles and responsibilities and make sure, you know, everyone's expectations are on the same page. Beyond that though, personally, I wouldn't borrow money to invest. Like I wouldn't borrow against my own 401k. I wouldn't borrow my home equity line of credit. I wouldn't take out some business loan to invest because the whole purpose of this investment for me is not a quick cash flow thing. It's a very long-term wealth building thing. And I don't expect it to generate like a very specific amount of returns to the dot on a year to year basis. For the most part, my projections have been pretty accurate, but then I have to allow for that to not be the case. I can't be at risk of defaulting on a loan just because I did math incorrectly. Like that is not a level of risk I'm comfortable with. And so this would be my question to you as far as like creative ways to finance, what level of risk are you willing to take? How to use AI in real estate. 
Um, I've seen people use AI to generate images for like a listing that they're trying to sell on Zillow. Um, actually, it's getting very confusing when I'm looking at these properties for sale, whether I'm looking at the actual images or has it been modified. Within the short term rental space, you can also use AI to help you with some of the answers. Like if you're trying to answer a guest, potential guest question of whether you offer discounts and you don't know how to phrase it nicely, but professionally, but firmly no, you can type that all into like ChatGPT or whichever chatbot and get a few options for how you can respond. Beyond that, I haven't really delved into more uses of AI that would suit us as our community, um, but let me do some digging. I think that's a good idea. Number 10, how do you personally control your emotions and remain sound, calm, and patient throughout this real estate journey? Great question. I'll share a few things that were helpful. One is having a partner. So my partner and I, we each have our own weaknesses. A really big benefit of having someone with you along on this journey is when you're spiraling and feeling like, man, I failed this one task that I'm supposed to do. How did I not know that there are two ACs and the ceiling is leaking? In that spiral, the other person can pull you back out. Like in your negative self-talk, they can be like, hey, it's okay, it's a problem we can fix. These are the steps we're gonna take right now to fix it, and these are the steps we will take to prevent this from happening again in the future. Or alternatively, when one person is like FOMOing and feeling like, man, I wish I would have done this sooner at this time, the other person can be like, hey, the markets go up and down. It is not in line with our goals to be gambling. It is more in line with our goals to like slowly build toward a future. So zooming back out, did it really matter so much that you missed this one, I don't know, opportunity of some sort? I think that has been the most helpful aspect. The second thing I think that is helpful is getting a balanced diet of different creators online as well as real life people. I think when we started especially, we were seeking information from a lot of like short-term rental experts, people who have a channel online and a presence somewhere. And it would seem like that it would be the norm to go from zero properties to 10 within a year or to, you know, have, I don't know, however many million dollars of portfolio, that that was the normal thing, that normally you would scale, normally you would put your job, this would be the amount of hustle that is required, this is the time that it requires. But oftentimes those are like the anomaly, right? Like the more regular average person may invest in one property every like five years if they're lucky. Or an average person would take a whole year to learn about like analyzing deals and submitting an offer. Maybe the time span it takes to do one thing and then learn the next thing and then learn the next thing. Like some of those time scales are skewed when you only look at a people who are online and telling you about the successes they've had. I think I really try to keep it like real and I only tell you what I've done. I'm not going to be the expert and you know, what am I trying to say? Like that's probably what I'm trying to do on this channel to give the perspective of a person who has a life, has kids, has a full-time job and has other interests and isn't fully just focusing on YouTube and Airbnb. What that timeline looks like for me to purchase a new property, to set up a direct booking website, all of these activities and how long it took me as a kind of quote unquote normal person, right? But I know my circumstances will of course be different than yours and our journeys are going to look very different. Our milestones are gonna be different. And so understanding that and maybe seeking out people in real life, like your coworkers who are semi interested in real estate and say they have been for the last three years, but haven't taken action or talking to friends who like have not even started thinking about retirement and how to save for that. Like it's easy to forget that there is a whole spectrum of people with different approaches to money, different approaches to investing, and we are all on a different journey. And I think sometimes just zooming out, removing yourself from social media can help give you that perspective that yeah, you know what? I'm actually doing all right. I'm doing all the steps I can to learn. I'm making progress. I'm not as fast as some of these people who are, 
you know, their sole Instagram purpose is to document how they're doing real estate and what deals they're doing and what greater and bigger things they've been up to. But you know what? I do know a few things that maybe my friends don't know. And I have just comparing myself to me two years ago, I have improved by this amount and that is enough. Number 11, how to start a real estate Instagram page and what content to put on there. I think kind of continuing on my previous point, we need a lot more content that is real. Uh, I personally, I'm kind of sick of the very aspirational, look at me closing my 10th deal this week, or I don't know, like it's just not relatable. And I don't want to be just a real estate person. Like that is not my aspiration in life. I don't want to be a landlord of a thousand doors. That sounds terrible to me. I don't want to describe people's homes as doors. That is actually kind of cringe. I just want to enjoy the things I enjoy in life. And real estate is one way to like diversify and help me get there faster. And that's all this is. And I know there's got to be more people like that out there. They're just not necessarily the people coming up with real estate Instagram pages. So if that's you, I would love to see that. But I think in general, um, I guess any social media, you're probably looking at a little bit of market research in your niche. What do people post about? What are the trending topics? I don't know, stuff like that. If you do set up your Instagram page, please post it in the comments below. We can all go take a look and give you a follow. Okay, I think I'm gonna have to pause here because this is going to be a very long video, but there are a lot more questions I want to answer and I will do that in the next week's video and I hope to see you there. Bye!